We're in the second week on our series, our new series on love and love intentionally. Last week, we talked about something that you all mastered. I'm absolutely confident. Patience. Are all of you masters of patience now? You worked on it for five days. We talked about patience and to jog your memory, we talked about how love is patient, how the word for patient was macrothumia, which means uh, patient with people, slow burning, slow to defend yourself, um, gentle, and uh, just less prickly uh, in, in general. And I gave you some, some Bible studies, some devotionals that were pushed to your inbox uh, through your church app every single morning this week, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. so that we could put up on a T for you um, the ability to think about this, to think about patience all day long. We're gonna do that the, same, for the exact same way this week as we move on to the next theme. Now I'm gonna give you a hint, the next theme, and we're not gonna be there quite yet, but the next theme is that love is kind. But what in fact is love? Love is something that the Apostle Paul commands us to do, not just between husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend. It's not just a romantic kind of love. It's an agape love, which is the love of choice, the love of commitment. I do it because it's right, whatever it takes, no matter what it takes, as long as it takes, because I'm committed. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what the circumstances are. I'm in it for good because God called me to be in it. That's the way we commit to our spouse. It's the way we commit to our families. It's the way we commit to each other in the church. It's the way that God committed to us through Jesus Christ. And so today we're gonna to be talking about love. And, and, and the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, the apostle Paul says that nothing that you do is any good without love. You can be as mouthy or gifted or, or vocal or opinionated as you wanna be, but unless you have love, you're just like somebody banging a cymbal. Nobody wants to hear you, you're just making noise. And in verse, in verse four, he starts to describe love and, and love is really important because you know we see love is patient, love is kind, love, it does not envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it doesn't uh, dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, um, doesn't keep any record of wrongs, it doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, love always perseveres, and guess what? Agape love never fails. I fail, you fail, we fail, love never fails. Now, what is God? God is love. God never fails. God demonstrated his love for us by giving us Jesus who never fails. Jesus demonstrated his love for us by giving us salvation, which if we receive the free gift of salvation, never fails. It's the perfect description of love. And so Jesus talked about this love, this sacrificial love in Matthew chapter 11. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. It's sandwiched right in between two very important events. Some miracles happened in Matthew uh, that we talked about together earlier, about a year ago, not quite a year ago. Uh, and then the Jesus had kind of gotten fed up with his hometown. The place that he had chosen to call home, the people just weren't listening to him. And he's like, man, guys, you have seen me do more than anybody else in the region. You have experienced the miracles. You've eaten the food. You've watched the, the people who were sick be healed and, and you don't believe in me. And so he pronounced, you know, what some people call a curse. That doesn't mean Jesus cussed them out. It means that Jesus said to them, it would be better for you if you were Sodom and Gomorrah, because if you were Sodom and Gomorrah and they had seen what you saw, Sodom and Gomorrah would still be here today. You're in trouble. And then he moves on. And he, he, he says this beautiful passage of scripture that we're gonna talk about. And then right afterwards, he looks at the Pharisees and Sadducees and says to them, you guys have forgotten all about grace. You're only concerned about the law. You have made religion about you and I'm tired of it. My paraphrase, really close to what Jesus said. But sandwiched in between there is this beautiful statement about salvation, about what Jesus does for us and about how he solves the condition that we're all born with or within the condition of the world. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the first thing Jesus does is he says, come to me. And the, the very next thing, the very next word is important. And he says, all. Now this whole passage is contrasted and compared 
to the religious expectations the Pharisees had made on the people in Jesus' day, where you had to be smart enough, you had to behave well enough, you had to know the right people, you had to give enough. The standard was always shifting and people never felt like they actually measured up or fit in. And Jesus was, he was done with it. And he says, come to me, all, which by the way means all. And some people say, well, I can't come to Jesus. I've done too much. I can't come to Jesus. If he knew who I really was, he wouldn't want me. Well, I can't come to Jesus because I'm a sinner. Well, I can't come to Jesus. I can't even come to church. And Jesus says, come to me all, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've thought, no matter what you've said, come to me all you who are what? Weary and burdened. The word weary, interesting word. Anybody a little tired this morning? Just a little tired, you just sort of wake up a little tired. We had some uh, kids in our youth group in first service and uh, one in particular came in and they were just, ah, oh, they were here and they're just walking in. And I was like, my goodness, I need to get you some coffee. Are you okay? And, and, and she's like, yeah, I'm just really tired. And I said, yeah, but you're here. And she smiled real big and it's like, that's it, right? She was tired, she still got here, but she wasn't weary like Jesus is talking about. Jesus actually described himself as weary um, when he was uh, in Samaria, when he sat down by the well and asked the woman at the well to give him some water. Do you remember that story? The Bible says that Jesus was weary. And what it means is, I have worked so much. I am so tired. My emotions, my mind, I'm just exhausted. I got nothing left. And maybe you felt like that before, that you just have literally nothing left that you have given everything you have to give. And Jesus, he says, come to me. Now, many people, and I am included, believe that Jesus is not just referring to people being stressed out and tired, but having been exhausted by religion and by the expectations of the church and the legalism and the judgmentalism and the hypocrisy. And in a sense, we're all born a little weary with a condition of our soul where we need rest. But Jesus says, maybe you're burdened. And burdened means that as you're living your life, people continue to dump um, weight on you. It's sort of like, let's say you're born and you're born carrying one weight where you're just sort of weary already because you're searching for truth and meaning. And it's not enough, but you carry your weight throughout your life and you carry it and it's heavy and you wish you could put it down because it doesn't feel so bad at first, but eventually it does. And then all of a sudden the world starts piling more stuff on you. And so you're weary and you also have a burden, but it doesn't just stop here, as you'll see in a few minutes. It continues to grow, but the weight that, that you carry, it accumulates over time to where it's like you're walking around with 400 pounds on your back. And he says, come to me, all who are weary, all who are burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke and learn from me. And then he describes himself as gentle and humble. And then he says this, and this is the good news for you and for me. And it's a promise from Jesus. You will find rest for your soul. Your restless soul the soul that intuitively knows that we're not good enough, that we don't measure up, the soul that searches for meaning and truth, the soul that convinces you to put things in your life, to anesthetize yourself, to distract yourself. It could be as damaging as drugs or alcohol or addiction. It could be as subtle as being a workaholic or, or pursuing you know, pleasure, leisure, buying things, collecting things, distractions a restlessness of the soul where we can't be present in the moment and at peace. And Jesus says, I know, I know that you're weary. I know that you're burdened. You were born that way, but I mean, it accumulates over time. And he says, all oh, come to me like John 14. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the flip side is you only get to Jesus or the God, the Father through Jesus, but the beauty is anybody can come. And so, he says, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Now, the yoke he's talking about is just voluntarily saying, I'll believe in you and follow you. 
The yoke of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was one that in Acts chapter 15, we learned that was so full of junk and expectations that, that even the Jewish forefathers couldn't, couldn't do all the stuff they thought they had to do. And so why in the world would they even expect anyone to? But you can put aside all of that stress and unsettledness and you can find rest. And it's not temporary, it's permanent. The kind of rest that lets you make peace with the past, the kind of rest that comes from forgiveness from the sin that we've accumulated over time, the kind of rest that sets you free on your purpose in this life, the kind of rest that guarantees you heaven to come at the end when this life is over, and then this last part is so beautiful, and this is where it connects to 1 Corinthians 13. So we're gonna bring it all the way back around to set up for the second half of our time together. And Jesus says, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke, following him, believing in him, is easy, and my burden is light. Now, Jesus is comparing easy the word that's translated into English, to what they had experienced about religion in the church for so many years, which was really difficult. But the word in English is not easy. If we translate the word from English or from the Greek, it's the same word that 1 Corinthians 13, 4 uses for kind. Jesus says, trusting me or following me allows me to do a kindness for your soul where I relieve the weary and burdensome weight that you've accumulated over time. And the ultimate act of kindness is Jesus extending and offering this rest through salvation for our souls. Love is patient, but love is kind. This is the kind of grace, the kind of grace that we're talking about, the kind of kindness that I'm gonna discuss with you in just a few minutes. This is the kind of kindness that can, that can change your life, can change your family, can change your job, can change your marriage. It's the kind of kindness that can change your church and ultimately the world. And we're going to break it all the way down as we like to do to what can I do to get started, to be part of this change, to be part of living this way. And we break it down to the most basic level because that's where I live and maybe that's where you live. So how can I repay kindness when I receive irritation so much of the time? If you're interested, and I hope you are, stick around because in just a couple of minutes after we sing, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna apply this together in a way that I think will challenge you as it has me and our pastors this week, but also inspire you. And, um, and I can't wait. Family. So um, I am a little concerned uh, today and I've been concerned all week. And here's the reason. The reason is that I, uh, believe it or not, and I hope you believe it, I think about you all week and I pray for you. And you know, we have a lot of people who attend Cap City, but not so many that I can't visualize maybe where you sit or, you know, who many of you are. And, and um, you know, when I pray during the week, I pray, you know, for you and I kind of visualize the room and, and uh, wanna make sure that what I'm doing, what I'm communicating is exactly what you need to hear um, from the Lord because I'm not interested in what I think that you need to hear if I'm not hearing from God exactly what it is that you need to hear. It's just my opinion. And so all week long and weeks before, as I'm preparing and planning these, these series, I've been asking God, show me what my friends need to hear because that's my job is to pass on information to you. And my fear today, my biggest fear is that this information I'm passing on to you today is something that you are going to dismiss, to think you already know, to think that it's too simple, uh, to think that you're too advanced and you're not really gonna grasp it. And, and I wanna warn you ahead of time, if you have a tendency to think that, just because kindness is something that we learn in kindergarten, I mean, my two and a half year old granddaughter Emery is learning to be kind, right? Um, it's not something we don't understand. It's just something we don't do. 
And I'm old, not as old as some of you, but older than a lot of you. And I've been a Christian for a long, long time. Uh, I was a, became a Christian when I was a kid, a Christ follower. And in my, excuse me, in my generation, um, you know, I became a, a pastor, a church staff member when I was 19 years old. I've been working or serving churches ever since. And, um, you know, there have been some deficiencies in my generation. There have been some really good things that have come out of the generation. When I say church, I don't mean every church, but I'm talking about there's been some general deficiencies that have come out of my generation. Now, I'm not responsible for the generation before me. I'm not responsible for the generation after me, except trying to help shape. But I am responsible for my generation. And there are uh, many, many people, Christians, or people who call themselves Christians, and many churches that just for too many years didn't act very Christian or very Christ-like. And instead of drawing the world toward Jesus, they drove the world away from Jesus. And oftentimes it was because they were so busy fighting for their rights that they forgot to live right. And while there's nothing wrong with trying to protect rights, there's something very wrong with not choosing to live the right way. It's the reason that you see so many churches crumble, so many leaders fall, because they get, we get way too preoccupied with what's out there, trying to command and control or to coerce, sometimes perhaps fighting God's battle with the world's ways. And even though I think many don't mean to, we drive people away from Christianity and one of two things happens. Christians either say, I don't like that. And so I don't want that. And they leave church and their relationship with Christ behind. Or, which I think is the more reasonable and better solution, the one that I've chosen, is to try to be a part of a solution and try to be part of change and to live a different way. But friends, it's much easier to preach politics than it is to preach this kind of stuff. Because this is the kind of stuff that requires you to do something. It requires you to live something. It requires an accountability that begins at home before it ever begins anywhere else. And it's so easy to focus on academic subjects and things that everybody nods their head about. But yet, oftentimes we skip the things that even the Apostle Paul says are the most important. Perhaps a translation of 1 Corinthians 13, one through three could be, you can change the entire world, but without love, you're wasting your time. Because what good is changing the world if it's not Christ that you're introducing people to? I'll give you an example. I was writing the devotionals that I will be giving you guys um, for this week, Monday through Friday. Pastor Jared's gonna push them to your inbox on your app, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. And I work hard on these things. And the reason I worked hard this week is because you guys did it last week. I was like, wow, so many of you actually did it and you read it. I can't make it any easier for you. We worked on patience last week. This week, we're working on kindness. We're working on kindness. And I'm writing about kindness. Now, here I am, church leader sitting there in bed next to my wife in the morning, early. She's sitting there doing her thing. I'm on my iPad, probably got the news on. And, uh, and I'm writing a devotional for you, literally in the process of writing about how we are supposed to meet people in their weaknesses and see weaknesses as opportunities to provide some strength. And uh, Joy's trying to sync her headphones to her phone. Now, truth be told, it's my fault that she had to sink her headphones because I took her headphones to the gym and she was trying to use mine. It's my fault in the first place. She didn't know how to sync her headphones. So she's sitting there with her Apple headphones in a little plastic case and she's opening them, shutting them, open them, shutting them, open them, shutting them. And when you open them on the screen of the phone, it pops up and goes, sync iPod. You know, and it was very clear what you do, right? Touch screen, sync, you know, it gives you the instructions, but she kept open and shutting, open and shutting. And so finally, instead of going, ooh, what a moment for me, a church leader to practice what I preach, because if it doesn't begin at home, what good am I out here? I finally got irritated and looked at her and said, just touch the screen on the phone. <laughs> and this is what I said. It's easy. That's what I said. It's easy. And I didn't say it nice. It's like, woman, you're interrupting me from teaching my church about kindness. 
that's my point. Churches for way too long have been so focused on trying to teach the world about kindness that they haven't been kind. I don't want you to miss it. And it begins at home, which is why I focus on our concentric circles. The people who are closest to you, the closest six, the closest three, the closest four. Churches are made up of people, families. Families come to church. You might be surprised how many families look bright, shiny, and happy on the outside when they come to church. Not at all on the inside, the way they live, the dynamic, unhealthy, unbiblical. And when Jesus Christ is invited into a family, families should operate differently. When families get together in a church, they do what they do as a family and a body and the churches operate differently. When the church operates according to biblical principles and moves out into the community and influences the world around us, the community begins to operate differently and they wonder why and they see Jesus because it's not natural for me to, to be gentle and help my wife sink her, her headphones. But it is reasonable and right and she deserves it. And what does it do? In some small way, it shows Jesus to her and to anybody else that may be paying attention. First Corinthians 13 says, love is patient. Love is kind. The word kindness is different than patience. Patience says, I will take almost anything from somebody without retaliation. Zip it. We talked about how we do it and then we start to feel it. We worked on it all week last week. This week, we're talking about kindness, which is different than patience, because kindness is not about taking almost anything from people. It's about giving almost anything to people. Kindness, it's a verb meant to be understood in action, not as a static principle. And it's a simple commitment to, to make sure that I'm willing to be useful to you that I'm willing to share a burden with you, that I'm willing to be a helper, that I'm willing to give you a little of my time, of my attention, a little more of my heart. Kindness is about giving. And not reacting is important. As a matter of fact, so important that it probably takes more than one week to work on it. But to be willing to be with people and to see areas where you may be able to help, as trivial as syncing a pair of headphones to an iPhone as minor as washing a dishes after dinner one night or helping your child with homework or listening to your spouse talk about a long day, even if the details are exhausting because they deserve to be heard. To begin to view the people around us as to how can I add to their lives? What can I do to share some of the weight. How can I make it easier for them? And man, that's Trump. That's hard. I mean, it's hard. If you look at the screen here, you'll see. I will live my life for the benefit of others. And I will be careful not to use other people's lives for my benefit. Loving kindness gives itself a way to help. I have a little visual demonstration here. We're gonna bring the weights back up. Remember, and I have a lovely and talented volunteer, Jason Askelson, who's gonna help me. Remember, we're all born with a burden, all of us. We're born burdened. We're born separated from God. We're born trying to figure out how we can alleviate this stress, the tension, the angst of the soul that we're born with. And so Jason, he's born with a burden and he's carrying this burden throughout life. And it's tough. And Jesus sees Jason, like he says in Matthew 9, or saw Jason as harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. And he wants to come alongside and he wants to give rest for the soul. But then we know that it's not just weary, but it's also burdened. And weariness is what we're born with and accumulate on our own. But yet other people, life, 
adds more stuff to us. And so the longer we go, the more weight we carry. And your wife is carrying a weight. Some you see and some you don't. Your kids are carrying a weight. Your friends are carrying a weight. Your coworkers are carrying a weight. The people around you are carrying weights that sometimes they don't even talk about. And an application of kindness is to come alongside somebody you love and to carry part of the weight for a while. You're not supposed to talk. <laughs> uh, that wasn't very kind of me, was it? Yep, here I am. Just do what I say, not what I do, right? Just carry a little of the weight for him for a while, right? Why? What difference does it make? Well, this changes me in the way I view other people and the way I view my role. I'm a helper. I'm a giver, not a taker. It's not about me. It's about him. His experience needs to be better. My experience doesn't have to be better. I look to God for strength. I try to give strength to Jason. Kindness is lending somebody strength in a moment of weakness. Maybe I can carry two. I don't know. Maybe I can't. But maybe he has somebody else in his life who comes alongside, picks up another one. And then maybe Jason comes to me and picks up one of mine. And all of a sudden, we're so busy carrying each other's burdens and loving each other with agape love that it doesn't look anything like the world around us because the world around us is all about piling on. Hey, carry some more, man. I don't care. I'll give you as many as you can take. And when you fall down, I'll find somebody else to carry them. Do you see the difference? It's my job to come and to help collect the burden, thank you, of people who may be closest to me. And you might think it's easy and the concept is super easy to understand, but I'm not sure you do it all the time. Um, and so Pastor Jared and I particularly worked hard this week on uh, five different applications that we're going to send to you every single day for you to do this in your own life. Now, I don't know how many of you are doing it. I have no idea. I mean, we know how many people have downloaded the app. And if you haven't, by the way, would you download the app? It's at the, in the Apple store. If you use the Apple, and I'm sure the Androids have a store too, and they probably have the church app. The logo's right there. It's Capital City Church with an O, not an A. Um, we don't make any money from you downloading the app. We don't collect any of your data. It's just simply a way for us to try to serve you better. And what I have literally done is I have prayed through um, each of these days in succession to try to help you apply each day kindness, beginning with the person you wake up to if you wake up next to somebody because that's your primary responsibility. Don't try to save the world or even change the world until you're worried about saving and changing your family. The people you see first during the day, if you don't have family, the people God holds you most responsible for. And so on Monday, I have given you a challenge. I've suggested on Monday that you take your list of people, I say six. I wouldn't pick more than six because that's a lot. Um, you can pick three, you can pick two. I don't know. Some people have more folks in their lives on a regular basis than others. Don't pick more than six. It gets overwhelming. I'm suggesting that you take these six, that you list them, and you take the one person on that list that you think it's the easiest person to bear one of their burdens, to lift one of their weights, and then put that person out of your mind and find the most difficult person on your list, the person who's ungrateful, the person who doesn't care if you lift a burden, the person who you don't wanna help. And I want you on Monday to go help that person, to find something you can do that's kind. Now, it's gonna be an easy thing to do. We're just kind of getting our feet wet. We're gonna roll right into Tuesday. And on Tuesday, we're gonna look at those who are overwhelmed with life who are burdened, who may be sick, who may be going through a tough time, who may have exams, who might have a stressful schedule. You look at the person in your family, you look at the person in your inner circle who's the most burdened, the most weary, and just come alongside them that day and relieve some of that stress. It requires sometimes a little more uh, mental awareness and maybe a little more time and effort, but you're sharing some of that following along with the example of Jesus in Matthew 11. And then on Wednesday, I'm getting into your business and stepping on your toes and I'm not sorry for it because one of the things that you and I, will we do to burden the people who are closest to us is we pile on weight to our families, to a boyfriend, to a girlfriend, to parents, 
goodness knows we do it to children, to coworkers, to friends. It's the weight of unrealistic expectations where we just have an expectation from people. And I know how I'm supposed to be treated by my, and if I'm not treated that way, I may not say anything about it, but I allow a brooding relational tension that just exists under the surface that's nasty and toxic. And it creeps over into judgmentalism and I mean, it's just, it's a slippery slope. And so on Wednesday, you're gonna go introspective and you're gonna look at the people closest to you and you're gonna say, do I have any unrealistic expectations that aren't Christ-like? Maybe I can relieve the burden of unrealistic expectations. And then you'll be a little sore after that. It's tired, tiring, and you know, like I said, your shoes will be dirty because it's, if you're honest, it's tough. On Thursday, we're gonna get to a hard one for me probably a hard one for you, more hard for men, I think, maybe than women, I don't know. My wife's much better at this than I. But on Thursday, I'm gonna ask you to be kind to the people around you, showing humility and gentleness like Jesus did in Matthew 11 by listening to them. No matter what they have to say, for as long as they wanna say it, even if the details are wandering, you know, and they don't really get back around to the point. When your children or child ask a question, when they have a story, when your coworker or your employee sharing something personal, we're not gonna point our feet to the door. We're not gonna interrupt. We're not gonna breathe heavy and huff. We're gonna serve all day by listening kindly to the people around us. I like to listen in a hurry. I listen efficiently, right? I already know what you're gonna say, so hurry up and say it, right? Now, oftentimes I don't, but how kind can I be? I just to keep my mouth shut and let somebody express themselves to me. Well, Friday is your day. We're going to go public. That'll be a fun day. You're going to skip all the people closest to you. You can be as unkind to them as you want to. Uh, hopefully by then you've learned to be kind to your inner circle. But Friday is going to be a day where you go out and you just do acts of kindness for whoever you may bump into because you're a kind person and you want to share your kindness with people who can do absolutely nothing for you in return. And these five days are gonna take you through a progression that mirrors the values of Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And by Friday, you will have put on the coat of kindness. You will have tried it out. You will have worn it through different iterations and examples and successes and failures. And by the end of the week, you're gonna know, are you a kind person? If not, why not? What do you have to work on? And then the most important question, am I willing to work on it? Because this is all stuff that we don't do intuitively. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we have to put ourselves in the current of the Holy Spirit and allow him to transform us into a new person by changing the way we think that our worldview, our perspective gets changed and we become like Jesus. But in the meantime, it takes a little effort. So that's what I'm asking from you this week. Let's do it together. And then on Sunday, you're not gonna wanna miss Sunday because I'm not moving on to the third characteristic of love because I'm not 100% sure you or I got these patient and kind principles down real well. So we're gonna take a week and we're gonna spend it in prayer and we're going to make sure that it sinks in, that we have applied it, that we're living it, that we're committed to it. And then after that strategic pause, I'll give you the third principle. I wanna pray for you. And this is fun, it's hard, but fun, and it's right. So let's do it this week together. If you don't have the app, by the way, download the app. I told you that. The notes will be available to you in a PDF file. Facebook, on YouTube, the church website, the church app, 
or there's a QR code that you can zap with your phone and the devotionals will go right to your device. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together. And um, I pray that we wouldn't just ignore this principle. This simple principle has been the omission of so many, myself more often than I'd like to admit. The church in general oftentimes has been right, but unkind. And rightness without kindness. Well, it's a sin. To stand for the right principles, but to just be want to want to be heard and, and to want to win without wanting to be Christ-like and wanting to influence. And I pray that we would live differently, that we would take responsibility for ourselves, that love would begin at home if we have a family, within our inner circle, to spill out into our church, into our community and all over the world. Loving kindness like Jesus. That's our goal this week, Father. Give us the strength to do it every morning at 7 a.m. as the reminder hits our inbox through our notification on the app. Today, I'm gonna live a different way through your help. In Jesus' name.